All right, welcome to our little lecture from Greg Smoke. Um, Greg is the Consulting State Scholar for the Think Water Utah Project and Director of the American West Center and Associate Professor of History at the University of Utah. He specializes in American Indian, American Western and Environmental and Public History. And currently at our museum, at Ucani, the Uinta County Heritage Museum, we have the H2O Today exhibit going on that Greg helped with. And um, it's from the Smithsonian and it's part of Think Water Utah, which is a statewide collaboration and conversation on the critical topic of water presented by Utah Humanities and its partners. And uh, we've had this here for two months now and it's been well received. It's been amazing some of the comments we get from um, all ages of people, but uh, I think uh, my, my most, uh, my favorite comment we got was yesterday from a little girl about four years old that says, they gave us a stat on how many kids um, die from lack of having, having access to clean water. And uh, it just kind of drives home the importance of water and uh, the fact that we're in a drought now really um, makes it a, a very uh, relevant exhibit that we have here out in Vernal right now. So without wasting much more time with me talking, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg and we'll hear from him. All right, thanks, Red. It, it's, it's good to be here today. Um, this is um, one in a whole series of talks I've given around the state over the last year or so, as two different Smithsonian exhibits have been touring the state as part of the Think Water Utah um, project. Of course, it's H2O Today that is in um, Vernal right now. Um, the essay that I wrote is called Utah Waterways, and that's taking its title from the other Smithsonian exhibit, which have, has already toured the state called Waterways. And what I've been trying to do is essentially um, look at some of the themes of that larger essay, but focus them on the communities where the exhibit is currently has been in play. And so um, what I'm going to do today is try to talk about the Uinta Basin and think about the Uinta Basin as a unique place in Utah's waterways and Utah's water history. Um, I can't talk about everything, so I'm going to limit it to a several topics. Um, there's a lot you could talk about in terms of the UNA Basin and waterways, and I'm going to share my screen right now so you don't have to look at me, but you see something far more entertaining. If I can figure out how to start my slideshow here. All right, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, like I said, the Uinta Basin is, is, is a unique and important place in Utah's water history. I'm not gonna talk about everything. Um, for example, in previous lectures around the state, I've talked a lot about John Wesley Powell. I'm not gonna talk about Powell today. And I'm gonna give, give Powell a rest, even though he is obviously a figure that is well known and as part of the area's water history. And I'm not really gonna talk in any detail about the Echo Park Dam controversy. Um, uh-oh, Megan's, Megan's upset about that. I'll mention it, but I'm not going to really go into that or spend a whole lot of time on that. Instead, I wanna focus on three themes that I think are, are fairly unique to um, the UNA Basin and also are important for understanding Utah's waterways more generally. And first I'm gonna start off talking about the physical world and how that shapes our responses to um, where we live, how we try to make a living in a particular place. Then I'm going to focus for quite a bit on native water rights and the struggle over native waters, um, because as many of you may know, of course, the, the Uinta Basin was um, native country and was the, the, the location of the largest Indian reservation in the United States, and, and not in the United States, in the state of Utah, and, and remains so today. So native waters is very important for understanding. And then finally, I wanna talk a little bit about this, the Central Utah Project and how waters are divided up and the demands upon Utah's waters in, in regard to our future and specifically about interbasin transfers, how water from the Uinta Basin makes its way um, to where I'm sitting on the Wasatch Front. So without further ado, I will, I'll, I'll 
move along here, let's start with this physical side of things. And to understand the Uinta Basin's waterways, you know, we first need to come to grips with the physical nature of the place, um, the physical nature of Utah. And that means considering where the water comes from, where we get our water. Now, like everywhere in Utah, the overriding fact is aridity. Depending on where you live in this state, um, you'll see somewhere between five and 15 inches of precipitation in a year. And the map you can see on here shows where some of the more, um, where you see the, the rainfall and where the driest points are. The driest place in Utah, of course, the West Desert. Um, you get a, a, as little as five inches of rain there, you know, or precipitation in a year. Um, the wettest places, of course, the high peaks of the Wasatch and the Uinta Range, um, where you can get, um, in terms of water, well over 15 inches of water and, you know, feet and feet of snow, right? Now, the Uinta Basin is one of the drier places in our very dry state. And you can see that over here, right? You can look at that map. You see that red section there. Um, it, it averages, vernal gets about nine and a quarter inches of precipitation each year. And that's not a lot. That's certainly not enough to sustain agriculture. Even though dry is the, the watchword all throughout Utah, the Uinta Basin is a little bit different than the rest of Utah. Though most of the state gets its moisture in the winter and early spring, in the Uinta Basin it's more evenly spread out throughout the year with the fall months of September and October actually being the wettest months of the year on average, rather than in many other places, you'll see March and April being the wettest months of the year. Now, only about five inches of that nine inches of precipitation though falls during the summer growing season. And that means it's far too dry to grow, grow crops without irrigation, certainly grow, grow them um, commercially. Now, why is the basin so dry? Well. It's a physical, oops, why is it not moving forward? There we go. Um, it, it comes down to a physical reason, right? The main reason that the U Uinta Basin is essentially one big rain shadow, right? With the Wasatch Range and the Wasatch Plateau and the Uinta Range essentially wringing moisture out of the air. And this is a phenomenon called the orographic effect. Um, in the American West, our weather patterns are dominated by the flows of air off of the Pacific Ocean throughout the fall and winter months. And air that rises um, cools. And in, in that process, it loses its ability to hold moisture, so it drops water. So that's the reason why the west side of mountain ranges throughout the American West are much wetter, greener, than the east sides. And that also means that mountain ranges throw what are called rain shadows, an area of dry, more arid land to the east of them, right? As, the, as that air flows back down, it regains, it's already dropped a lot of its moisture, but it also regains the ability to retain moisture, right? So that's, what, that's the reason why we're real, uh, truly in a, a rain shadow. Now, the Uinta Basin is also a watershed. Right. This is another concept that I've written about in the, the Waterways essay. Um, watersheds are hydrographic or catchment basins where all the water within ultimately funnels down to a low point. Um, it could be a river, it could be a lake, it could be the sea often. Right? Um, mountain ranges and ridges mark off watersheds and they force water to flow in one direction or another. Now it's important to understand that Utah is divided into two great natural watersheds. To the west is the Great Basin watershed. Right? To the east, where Vernal is situated, is the Colorado River watershed, which encompasses, of course, the, the waters of the Green River as well. Right? Um, each of these watersheds, though, is in turn made up of um, its own smaller sets of watersheds. You can see the Uinta Basin over here is part of this larger Colorado River um, watershed. Right. So the Colorado, the Uinta Basin is one of these watersheds um, and it catches the water that flows out of the Uinta Range to the north and east from the Wasatch Plateau and the Wasatch Range. Um, but it's also part of this much larger Colorado River Basin. And this is another important thing to consider here is that the, you know, the Colorado and Green River system is a classic exotic river. 
And by exotic river, it doesn't mean it's lined with jungles or there's strange animals running around or anything like that. When a geographer talks about an exotic river, what they're referring to is a river that rises in much higher, more humid lands like the Rocky Mountains and then flows through an arid desert region. Sort of the quintessential exotic river is the Nile. And the Colorado has been referred to as the American Nile, right? The Colorado in green, the green rises in the Wind River Mountains of Wyoming, the Colorado, of course, in the high Rockies um, of, of, of Colorado. Those waters then funnel down and, and go through this area, this very, um, this very arid land. Now, of Utah's you get into the people here, I don't want to just talk about the physical nature of things, but if we look at these two watersheds, another important factor to consider is that while um, the Colorado River watershed has far more water than the Great Basin watershed, most of the population of Utah lives in the Great Basin. And I'll get back to that in a minute. Now, when I said the Colorado watershed has far more water, that's a relative term. It's obviously not a huge amount of water compared to say the Columbia River or the Mississippi River, but it still is far more than you'll find in the, in the Great Basin. Now, what is constrained population and constrained use of water in the Colorado River Shed is not so much the flow of water, but it's historic inaccessibility, right? Along their courses, the green and the Colorado often run at the bottom of steep, very remote, very rugged, canyons. It's what makes it a great place to be a river runner. Right? We enjoy going down these rivers, but what that means is that it's only in places where canyons open up, like the Uinta Basin or the area around Green River, Utah, or Spanish Valley around Moab, that their waters become easily accessible. So unlike areas farther east and unlike the big rivers in the United States, like the Mississippi, the Columbia, the Ohio, the rivers of Utah have never been used much for transportation. They're more of an obstacle than they are an avenue for transportation. Right? Now, the, the Utah population, of course, lives mostly, as I said, in the Great Basin watershed. And here's a map again, the, the, a comparative map here that shows you population and, and rainfall. And I'm not suggesting that rainfall is the only reason for population or else we would not have this whole cluster of folks living down here in Washington County around St. George. There's other reasons and then just a natural or environmental reason, but it does make a difference. And certainly with early settlement, right? So the vast majority of our state's population actually lives in the other major watershed, the Great Basin. And that income, the Great Basin itself is an interior basin where none of the waters um, that flow into the Great Basin escape. They either evaporate in, in playas or in places like Great Salt Lake, obviously the most famous um, saline lake and the largest saline lake in um, the United States. Um, even though there's less water, it's the nature of the rivers and the nature of the ge geography even larger that allow for populations to, to thrive in these areas. Um, Small rivers, but we have many streams that fall from the steep Wasatch Range, the plateaus farther south. And what they essentially do is create an oasis zone. And you can see that oasis zone very clearly on the map on the right. The dark blue stretching from the Cache Valley and then through Weber, Davis, Salt Lake, and Utah counties, right? We could also throw in the San Pete Valley in the area down here on Richfield. These are areas that drain higher plateaus, right? The fact that moisture flowing from the west hits these highlands, rises and drops its, its precipitation means that you're gonna see more rain in these places. Along the Wasatch Front, you may get 15 inches of precipitation in a year. Still not really a lot, but far more than in the Uinta Basin, certainly far more than you know, in the West Desert. So today, even though there's more water in the Colorado River, Basin, the vast majority of our population, and I mean the vast majority of our population, over 80% lives in that strip of land that we call the Wasatch Oasis Sun, right along the foot of the Wasatch Mountains. So those are some of the basic physical characteristics 
you know, to think about that Utah is an arid place, but that aridity is, is um, more impactful in particular areas. And the presence of water has been long been a place, something that has shaped our history. Now, what I want to do now, though, is then move on to native waters. Oops, there was, I missed a, there we go. I know, skip past the slide there, All right? Um, and this population factor leads us to point two in, in, in an important way. And that's the importance of native waters and the struggle for native water rights. Now, the Uinta Basin was undeniably Ute territory. And it is, of course, today the home of the Ute tribe of Utah and the UNO reservation. Um, but its aridity and its comparatively limited resources meant that the Utes did not live there in large numbers throughout the year. They, again, they certainly saw it as their territory, but it wasn't a place where large populations of people lived throughout the year. The higher country to the east in modern Colorado and southeast Utah, as well as the, especially those rich lands of the Wasatch Oasis, particularly Utah Valley and then areas of the Sanpeet Valley. These were the core of, of places of youth life. Um, for example, the Utah Valley homeland, the Timpanogos Utes was among, was the most densely populated place in the entire Wasatch Oasis before the arrival of, of Mormon pioneers. Um, and this was because it was a location where the greatest native fisheries in the interior West. Um, and Timpanogos Utes fished on the lake and all of its tributary streams um, their most productive fishery was at the mouth of the river, the Provo River, which they called Timpandaquin, which means stream with the rocky bed. Um, while some you people lived there year round, many other groups would travel hundreds of miles even in a year to visit during the, the fish runs. And on the left, you see a map of the Utah Valley that was produced by the Stansbury Expedition in 1850, which also um, holds the, the renderings of the Ute words, and you can see Timpanogos River right there above that line. And that was some um, means, that's essentially the Provo River. Now for the first year and a half of Mormon settlement, uh, Mormon settlements expanded from the Salt Lake Valley north to modern day Ogden. But it was those areas around Utah Lake that were incredibly attractive. These were productive lands. The waters of the rivers could be used for irrigation. And in 1850, the church finally launches a permanent settlement in the Utah Valley. And this, of course, will lead, become a flashpoint. It will lead to decades of Ute Mormon conflict um, and eventually result in the removal of Ute people from the rich and relatively well watered lands of the Wasatch Oasis and from central Utah, from the San Pete Valley. Right? And it's in the San Pete Valley, of course, that the, the Black Hawk Wars is, flares in 1865 and will, will run into the early 1870s. By that point, the Utes have been largely removed from this core area of their, their, their lifeways. Now, where did they go? Well, they are sent to the Uinta Basin, right? Part of their, whoops, I keep jumping ahead two slides part of their homelands to be sure, but not a very productive one, right? And by 1860, Brigham Young and other church leaders were looking for a place to remove native peoples from these very coveted lands of Utah Valley and along the Wasatch Oasis. And the arid, remote Uinta Basin seemed like the perfect option. The area held little early interest for the Mormons. Um, Brigham Young survey, survey party and this is one of the, I'm going to use one of the most overused quotes in Utah history, but it's one of the funniest quotes of all. His survey party returned and they called the Uinta Basin, quote, one vast contiguity of waste and measurably, measurably valueless, except for nomadic purposes, hunting grounds for Indians, and to hold the world together. Not exactly a real estate um, um, not, not exactly a real estate advertisement for the Uinta Basin. But of course, they're looking at it in terms of places that can be readily farmed with the type of labor that they have at hand, the type of small communal um, irrigation works that they have been building along the Wasatch Oasis zone. Um, 
Now, this isn't going to last forever, though. Very soon, as, as white settlement, as Euro-American settlement spreads throughout the, the Wasatch Oasis zone, um, settlers are going to start to covet the basin and its waters. Right. As I should say that, that in 18, I'm jumping ahead here, I miss it, in 1861, shortly after that survey by Young's people, um, Abraham Lincoln declared the, the, the Uinta Valley Reserve for the Indians of Utah, right? And so that, that's going to be established um, as a reservation in 1861 by executive order. The Spanish Fork Treaty of 1865 achieved legal removal, essentially. Um, but it's the protracted Black Hawk War that I mentioned that stretches from 1865 into the early 1870s that really um, that really begins um, that really achieves I should say Ute removal from Central Utah. But again, the waters of the Uinta Basin are fairly quickly going to be coveted by settlers um, as early as 1879. Mormon farmers in the Heber Valley began a series of projects to illegally divert water from the Ute Reservation over the divide, essentially, and bring it into Daniels Canyon so it could flow down into the Heber Valley. And um, Utah Humanities has a radio um, spot called um, Beehive Archive, and I think the most recent episode is on that Daniels um, Canyon diversion, so you can um, get a hold of that online and, and listen to that to hear more about that story. Okay. Um, this was far from being um, controversial at the time. Um, many Euro-American, many, many Utahns saw this as a proper use for the water. Even the Ute agents supported its continued use. And those diversions continued to be in operation until 1992, until the passage of the Central Utah Project Completion Act of 1992. Now, federal Indian policies at the time, and this is the late 19th century, right? The, the reservations established in 1861. Um, it will come on, it become more and more coveted as time um, passes. Federal Indian policy aimed at assimilating Native peoples facilitated the cause of settlers, of, of white colonists who want to move in and, and take advantage of these lands in this water. Um, very famously, the 1887 Dawes General Allotment Act empowered the government to break up tribally held reservations into individual allotments. The theory was that by turning um, individual native people into farmers, that they would um, absorb the values of white, capitalist Americans. And that was, that was the concept behind um, the Dawes Act. The surplus land, once you divided up the reservation and divvied it up among the, the tribal members, the lands that were left over would be open to white settlement. This was called surplus lands. And you can see a, a, a broadside there for Indian land um, for sale. Right. So in theory, private property and agriculture would um, transform Native peoples into these individualistic American citizens. But you people had no historical or cultural basis to become farmers. Right? It was not part of their experience and not something most youths wanted to do. A handful of youths would take up farming. And I'll talk about that in, in a minute. But in practice, what allotment did was dispossess Native peoples. Right? It didn't transform them into white capitalist farmers. What it did do, though, is take their lands. And that's going to happen um, under the Dawes Act at the, um, at the UNO Reservation in 1905. Um, now, although turning Indians into farmers was the stated goal of federal policy, the actual efforts on the youth reservation as elsewhere moved very slowly until the water would also benefit white settlers. Right. Um, so well before, um, excuse me, before 1899, about a dozen small scale canals had been built by the Bureau of Indian Affairs on the reservation and served a handful of youth farms. Um, the Mormon church also built one ditch as part of a missionary effort. But it's really after allotment comes to the reservation in 1905, 
And I should explain that the Dawes Act made a lot in federal policy, but it did not allot any specific reservation. That occurred at different times in different places. So allotment came to the Ute Reservation in 1905, right? And this opened up much of the reservation to, um, to Euro-American settlement and irrigation development sped up. You can see the impact in terms of land holding on the Ute Reservation when you look at this map on the right. So the black line is the original reservation, right? in its, its largest form. What you see color-coded are the land holders today. So the land that is actually owned by the Ute tribe of Utah in, in trust, it's held in trust by the United States government and owned as tribally held land is in orange, right? All of the pink is privately held land. That's land that's owned essentially by Euro-Americans who bought it as surplus land. The blue are state lands. And then what happened in many cases in, in the United States is that the Forest Service came in and, and took up a lot of lands as well. They were made into national forests. And so much of the U International Forest was originally um, tribal lands, right? So what you see is a fracturing of land ownership. Um, Euro-Americans come in and they will benefit largely from these early developments. In 1905, as I said, the federal government allotted the reservation, opened much of it to white settlement. Irrigation development sped up after that, especially after the following year. In 1906, the Indian Irrigation Service was founded within the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And a project was initiated called the Uinta Indian Irrigation Project, the UIIP. Um, and while that was meant to serve native farmers, it really benefited white settlers, the ones who had come in in 1905. Uh, many of them also worked and made money as laborers building it rather than the jobs going um, to native peoples. And again, the government legitimized the idea um, that whites would put the, the water to a superior use. Um, as part of the allotment process, portions of the Strawberry Valley were withheld and reserved as a reservoir site, quote, necessary to conserve the water supply for the Indians or for general agricultural development. There was always that caveat that, that non-Native people could also benefit from it. And this gave rise to, um, eventually would, very quickly would give rise to the Strawberry Valley Project. And this was the first project that the Bureau of Reclamation would undertake in the state of Utah. The Bureau of Reclamation was founded in 1902 as the Reclamation Service. Uh, again, the first project it would do in Utah was the Strawberry Valley Project. And this is built between 1906 and 1922. And this was also the first larger scale inner basin transfer of water in the state of Utah. Um, the idea for the, the Strawberry Project, as you can see here, was to move water from the Colorado River Basin to farms in the Spanish Fork area in the southern end of Utah Valley, right? So it's an inner basin transfer. We'll talk more about this later. Um, it's done because the government is going to, um, you know, deny you rights and essentially force the Utes to accept um, an agreement. Not only were the Utes denied grazing fees um, for the land that lands that were withdrawn for this project, their title to the land itself was extinguished by Congress without tribal consent in 1910. And the Utes were paid a dollar and a quarter an acre for reservation lands that would then continue to, to be used for this project. Right. Now, of course, Ute waters became coveted again in the mid 20th century with the development of the Central Utah Project. And with the authorization of the CUP, I'll talk about that in a minute, the CUP comes about in the wake of the Colorado Basin River Storage Project Act of 1956. So it's the 1960s that it is, it is begun. Um, it, it, Ute water became essential for the success of this project. In 1965, the state and the tribe negotiated an agreement to allow the Central Utah Project to divert 60,000 acre feet of Ute water to the Wasatch Front 
in exchange for developing CUP, CUP projects that would serve tribal lands. So what the tribes basically did was agree to forego their right for 40 years if the government built their projects. Um, that didn't happen. Um, there was, the projects remained unfinished after decades. Um, in terms of the Central Utah project, the projects, whoops, keep doing that. The projects that were completed were the ones that served Euro-American farmers the most, right? The Jensen and the Vernal parts. The Ute Indian unit, the Uinta unit, and the Upalco unit have never been completed. The other unit, which becomes the real focus of the Central Utah project, of course, is the Bonneville unit. And that is the unit that is dedicated to an inner basin transfer of taking waters from the Uinta Basin and moving them to the fast growing um, Wasatch Front. Um, after years of legal wrangling, um, the Utes finally reluctantly accepted a settlement of $295 million to be paid off over a 50 year period. And in 1999, after the government failed to continue working on the projects as promised, um, the Ute tribe withdrew from um, its support from these projects. And so those portions of the Central Utah project are effectively um, negated at that point, they're effectively killed off at that point. Right. So this part, this, this taking of native waters and this struggle for native waters, we can talk more about it in legal terms and in question and answer if, if wanted, brings us to this final point, And that is really to focus more on water rights in Utah and Utah's need to demand to develop its water resources um, to the fullest degree in order to assert its claims against other states, right? And that's gonna get us into both water law and it will get us into, um, into the, the history of uh, interstate conflicts over the Colorado River Basin itself, right? Now, and I'm throwing, I feel like I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff here. So what I'm going to do is do a little primer on water law so people understand just very briefly here that water law in the American West is different than in the American East. That riparian doctrine, there are two types of water law really dominant in the United States, riparian doctrine and prior appropriation. I'm not gonna spend much time on riparian doctrine because it really is associated with the East and places that get adequate rainfall. The basic things to remember is that in riparian law, um, water rights are attached to land ownership. If you live along a stream, you have a right to that stream if you do not diminish it, right? That's the main, the, the key there. In the American West, where it's arid and where the West is colonized by the United States at a time when capitalism is fully formed, you get a very different water doctrine and that is prior appropriation. Okay. Now prior appropriation is based on two premises. First is, the, is, is called first in time, first in right. And the second premise is beneficial use. The way to understand this is that under prior appropriation, um, land ownership does not bring with it any water right. Water rights are separate from land ownership. Water rights are acquired by filing a claim with the state. Those who file their claim on, on a watershed ahead of another claimant have a superior or senior water right and they can demand all of the water they, they can use in a given year, right? So that's the first in time, first in right part. The other part of it is beneficial use, right? That water must be put to a beneficial use. You must prove up your claim. It's not, it's not you are not supposed to be able to sit on it, to use it for speculative purposes, to sell it to somebody else. Right, and in, in fact, that's how rights were first established in, in the pioneer West was to actually divert a stream and put it to some use. That's what happened in the California gold fields where prior appropriation first developed. But by the end of the 20th, by the end of the 19th century, excuse me, prior appropriation becomes the dominant doctrine throughout the American West, even in Utah. 
right? So the application of these legal doctrines is always embedded in unique social and political histories. Um, and during the first half of this first half century of colonization in Utah, water allocation moved from a very communitarian church controlled system to a fully capitalist doctrine of prior appropriation. So by the time of large scale Euro-American colonization came to the Uinta Basin, prior appropriation is the law of the land, right? That's very different than other places in Utah. So the Uinta Basin didn't go through that earlier period of church controlled water rights like you would find along um, the Wasatch Front, the Wasatch Oasis, the Sanpete Valley, the Severe Valley, et cetera, right? Now, how like many of you know, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm talking to folks who are out there in the Uinta Basin, you probably know your, your, your county zone history out there, but you know, the Uinta Basin is, is, sees Euro-American settlement quite late in Utah history, right? The, the first um, white ranchers came into the Ashley Valley in the 1870s. They were former employees of the U agency. Vernal itself though was not um, um, incorporated as, as, as a city until 1897. And most of the Uinta Basin towns all were founded at the same time. 1905, when the Ute Reservation was, was allotted. Roosevelt, Mighton, Duchesne, all are founded and incorporated in 1905 in direct response to that allotment and the settlement, this huge flow of, of settlers who are coming in to take up Ute lands. Okay, so that's a little bit of, of um, background there on, on law, okay? Now this brings us back though to this physical side of things into the Colorado River Basin itself, which the Uinta Basin and Vernal are part of. Um, the legal situation is, it's not just about the law within Utah or the law between Euro-Americans or native water rights. It's also between states and it's also between nations. Um, as I mentioned before, the Colorado River system is a exotic river. Um, it, it flows from humid highlands through very arid regions. Seven of the driest states in the United States, um, as well as the nation of Mexico have claims on the basin's water. And you can see the basin here. You can see the headwaters of the green, the headwaters of the Colorado, right, flowing through um, seven different states. Now, by the turn of the 20th century, California, was already the Goliath. California was already by far the most populous state in the American West. It was already undergoing, um, undertaking massive water projects, including diverting the Colorado, right, to the Imperial Valley. And so this is a scary thing for the other states that depend upon um, the Colorado River, who, who have a claim on the Colorado River. In 1902, the Federal Reclamation Service, now the Bureau of Reclamation, was founded. Um, and looming developments, further developments on the lower Colorado River would potentially benefit California even more. And the other basin states feared that their own economic development would be set back if they did not assert their right to the river. Right? So this becomes an interstate um, conflict. And this conflict continues today. I'll, I'll finish talking a little bit about what the Utah State Legislature created in our last um, legislative session. Right? Now, to avoid conflict, a, Cal a Colorado water attorney named Delph Carpenter, and that's him over here, um, Delph Carpenter proposed a solution. He proposed that the seven states of the Colorado River Basin get together and create an interstate compact a binding agreement that would allocate water from the river system to each state. The plan was intended to prevent years of costly litigation um, and remove the allocation of water from the unpredictable hands of judges and courts. So it was gonna be, be a contract. Congress would go ahead and create the Colorado River Co Commission in 1922 and its members would come together in a rather sometimes acrimonious and very conflictual 
set of negotiations. And I love this picture of the Colorado River Commission because these gentlemen look like, boy, they don't really like each other. They, they, they're not happy about sitting in the same room once again. Um, you can see some, some faces there that aren't, aren't looking um, very, very happy. Um, you can see Herbert Hoover right here, future president of the United States and secretary of commerce who was tasked with leading this commission. You also see Ari Caldwell, the um, third from the left up here, who is Utah's water engine, state engineer and representative for the state of Utah in those negotiations who, who allied with Carpenter to really fight for the rights of the upper basin states, right? Now I mentioned upper basin states. What happens is that these, these men come to the agreement to divide the Colorado River Basin in half. And that's what you see here on the left, right? So they create a system divided into two basins. The upper basin consists of four states, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. The lower basin consists of Arizona, Nevada, and California. The dividing line is Lee's Ferry just south of the Utah border in north, extreme northern Arizona, just downstream from Glen, the modern Glen Canyon Dam, right? Now, the years leading up to the compact had been unusually wet and the commission operated under a huge error, a really consequential mistaken belief that the Colorado River system on average carried at least 15 million acre feet of water per year. We know now today that that simply is not true, that cycles of drought, long-term and short-term cycles of drought mean that in many years, the Colorado carries far less water. I, can't, I don't need to tell people that today. We are in a, we are in a mega drought as it's referred to right now. Um, Lake Powell is at 35% capacity. Um, every day I look at the newspaper and there's more stories on um, features in Glen Canyon that are re-emerging from under the water. Um, the New York Times and the Washington Post are continually covering the drought and this potentially um, catastrophic fire season we are facing. So it, I, I don't need to convince folks that that simply was not true, that there's not that much water in the system in many given years, right? So based on this false premise, each basin was promised seven and a half million acre feet a year, right? And that is, it's a, it's a concrete number. It's not a percentage. That's important to remember. Under the compact, the lower basin is promised seven and a half million acre feet a year, not 50% of the river's flow, right? That, could, that would be a very different thing. Now, within each basin, the lower and the upper basin, subsequent agreements did divide the water up by percentage, okay? So for instance, the upper Colorado River Basin Compact of 1948 states that Utah is entitled to 23% of the upper basin's water or 1.71 million acre feet per year, right? So while, the, while the ba within the upper and lower basins, the water is divvied up by percentage, it, between the basins themselves, it's on an absolute number, seven and a half million um, acre feet. And so while a compact is becoming enduring, has become an enduring cornerstone of Western water law, it failed to head off more conflict than litigation. Arizona refused to sign the agreement until 1944, 22 years later, and it remained locked in legal war with California until 1963. And there've been subsequent battles before the Supreme Court between Arizona and Colorado over the, the state's relative um, rights to um, the Colorado. So the, the, the compact did not um, solve that problem. But what it did do though, is point out to the upper basin states um, or, 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 or instill in the upper basin states this demand to improve, um, to I shouldn't say improve, but to develop water resources, right? Because if, as long as they did not develop their water resources, it didn't matter if they had a right to seven and a half million acre feet of water, it would all flow downstream to California. And again, California is the boogeyman from the beginning of the 20th century on. It is the, 
it is the state that we envy and the state that we despise because it is big, it's powerful. Now, what this means though, is that you need to develop your waters, right? In water law parlance, um, there are phrases, paper water and wet water. So water attorneys talk about paper water. When they talk about paper water, what they mean is a legal right to water. That's not the same thing as wet water, which is real water. The difference between the two is infrastructure development. Until you actually develop a system to take that water and use it, all you have is a paper right, right? So without the infrastructure to collect and deliver water, the right remains only a written promise. And so development is the focus. There is little incentive to develop, develop to, excuse me, to delay development in the West. Quite the opposite, Western states have tended to push forward as rapidly as possible with water projects as a means of turning the promise of paper water into real wet water, right? Now, as I said before, the initial developments on the Colorado River were far downstream. They were in California. Right. Um, so the upper basin wanted development. That development would be stalled for decades. It would be stalled by the Great Depression and then World War II. But in the immediate years after World War II, there was a big push to develop the upper basin system. Right. Now, we, I said I wouldn't go into the detail, but of course, by 1950, a cornerstone of that upper basin development plan were the two dams that would be built at Echo Park and at Split Mountain and Dinosaur National Park. Those, of course, were defeated after a major public relations um, push by, by environmental groups and by wilderness advocates that stopped the construction of those dams. Instead, what is going to be passed by Congress is the 1956 Colorado River Storage Project Act. And that's what you see on the left here. This act is a comprehensive development plan for the upper Colorado River Basin. The two cornerstones of it, of course, that affect Utah history are the Flaming Gorge Dam, which you see on bottom right, and Glen Canyon Dam, um, top right in this picture. But many other projects too, irrigation projects, including, of course, the Central Utah Project, right? It's an associated project with the 1956 Act. Right? So this means that for finally that the upper basin is gonna develop its water resources on a local and regional scale. The Central Utah Project would be the largest project ever, water project ever undertaken in the state of Utah. And it remains in many ways the cornerstone of the state of Utah's plans to fully grasp or, or to control its share of the Colorado River Basin waters, right? It has multiple units and phases. We, I showed you a map of it earlier. I'll show you another map in a minute. Um, it's meant, the Central Utah Project was meant to provide water both for Uinta Basin farmers and communities, as well as supply the urban Wasatch Front with water for municipal and industrial development. Right, by moving the water from one watershed to another, the massive inner basin transfer. And so much of the focus will be on the so-called Bonneville unit, the Bonneville unit, the westernmost unit of the CUP, which transfers water from the Uinta Basin to the Wasatch Front, to the Great Basin watershed, where it was used not so much on crops anymore, but really toward aimed more at a continuing urban growth along. Um, the Wasatch Front. And of course, that transfer of water was nothing new, right? It was started in 1879, um, you know, way up here at the, the, the top of, um, to transfer water over to Heber, essentially, in that Daniels Canyon. This is after the, um, the, the, um, the Completion Act, so that's, that's no longer in play at that point. But the Duchesne Tunnel will transfer water to the Upper Provo, where it flows into the Jordanell Reservoir. Of course, we get improvements from the Strawberry Reservoir through the Diamond Fork system that brings water down into the Spanish Fork Valley again. Um, so this is it's not a new idea, but it is a massive undertaking that, um, that, that creates the largest interbasin transfer in, in Utah history. 
And while the project is not nearly as large as it was once intended, it still will provide over 100,000 acre feet of water annually to the rapid growing communities of Salt Lake and Utah County. Right, so that's where we kind of are, um, brings us to where we are um, today, right? As Utah faces its water future, it faces a couple of real issues. One, of course, is, is, is global warming, is climate change. And we're seeing, you know, extended droughts, we're seeing um, shorter winters and all kinds of things that we might talk about. But we're also seeing some massive population growth population growth that is centered along the Wasatch Front, not surprisingly, where the population always has been, perhaps more concerningly <laughs> down here in Washington County in extreme Southwest Utah, where there's never been the water to support that kind of population. But what this also means though, is the state is continuing to look at the Colorado River Basin for more water. In the 2021 legislature, the state of Utah created, um, um, they established a new committee, the Colorado River Authority of Utah, it's called. And this is a body charged with pursuing full development of Utah's allocation of the Colorado River um, um, water and undoubtedly focused mostly on um, more inner basin transfers. Of course, the most famous, the most infamous current project under consideration is the Lake Powell pipeline, which would transfer water from Lake Powell um, to the rapidly growing communities far, far south and in Washington County around surrounding St. George. Right. And so this is where the Uinta Basin, I think, is central to this part of Utah's water future, that the Uinta Basin remains you know, part of this Colorado River um, part of the Colorado River Basin and will be the focus of um, continued development, I think, and continued efforts to try to transfer that water out of that basin and to, um, to the fastest growing urban areas in the state of Utah. All right, well, I'm going to stop there. I think I've gone over time, actually. I went on quite a while, <laughs> but I'm happy to entertain questions if folks have questions either in the chat or in um, in person if you just want to raise your hand Greg yeah Greg um, so I was just wondering what the legal process if, if you know was to put in the transfer of water like from Strawberry and Jordanelle to the Wasatch Front, did other states have to get involved in any of that legal process? And was it? That contentious? doesn't I mean in other states because it's within the state itself. It did impact native water rights, Ute water rights. And um, this is where we get into the real complexities of, of water law. So under prior appropriation, um, you have to file a claim on those waters. And so when the Central Utah project, for example, or let's go back, when the Strawberry project was um, established, the Bureau of Reclamation filed um, a regular straight up water claim with the state of Utah on those streams, like the Strawberry River and so on, and acquired that water right to transfer that water, right? Now, over time, um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was also complicit in allowing that to occur, right? And I, 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 I hesitate to jump into the complexities of water law here. I mentioned prior appropriation and I mentioned um, riparian law. There's actually a third critically important water right class in the United States, and those are federally reserved water rights. Under the Winters Doctrine, which was a Supreme Court case decided in 1908, Native peoples have water rights vested in their reservations dating back to the founding, the founding of the reservation. So that would make 1861 essentially the priority date for Ute water. But the Bureau of Indian Affairs, when it developed the Uinta Indian Irrigation Project from 1906 to the 1920s, decided to follow Utah law and to file a regular regular claims using the state water law rather than pursue 
the federally reserved rights. And that meant that those rights were not as senior, right? And so then later during the Central Utah Project, the same kind of process took place where the Central Utah Project had the Bureau of Reclamation for the Central Utah Project had to file claims on those waters. That by this point, the Utes are asserting more of a right and that's where you get that agreement between um, the state and, and the Ute tribe in, in 1965 um, for the 60,000 acre feet of water that eventually the Utes um, simply are paid for rather than getting the development of the water. But the, the long, the short answer to that is you that essentially throughout all of this, state law was followed and it was based on prior appropriation and filing a claim with the state engineer's office to acquire the rights to develop those projects. And I'm sure thanks law attorney right now, there's somebody who would be upset at me for simplifying it that way because it's even more complex than that. Well, I, I can imagine with all the, the states that are downstream of us, um, is that similar to what's going on with the pipeline from um, Lake Powell to St. George? Uh, yeah, is there other states involved in that or is this just on the state level? You know, that's that would be again within, essentially within the state, although I'm not quite sure how Arizona responds because the, the the proposed pipeline actually travels part of the way through Arizona, right? But the idea is that, you know, if, I'm sure that if right of ways are purchased, I'm not sure how, you know, that would work, but the water is being transferred from within Utah in the upper basin to another, another place in Utah in the upper basin. So it shouldn't violate, I would think, the, the Colorado River um, compact. The way that Utah is looking at it, the way that Washington County water folks are looking at it, the way this Colorado River Authority that's just been established is looking at it, is that Utah does not use its full allocation of Colorado River water. This will allow um, Utah, the state of Utah to do so, right? And so as I have not seen any um, moves by other states to, um, to, to block it in that way. Not yet, at very least. Not saying it won't happen. Megan. So there's a lot of engineering and a lot of public resources and a lot of money um, invested in building this enormous plumbing project. And on the one hand, what a glorious uh, tribute to human innovation. Um, on the other hand, knowing that Utahns are water hogs and we're the second uh, thirstiest people as a state in the country, even though we're also the, like the second driest state second driest. in the country, um, and that 82% of our water is actually going to agriculture, um, although you're saying that most of the water that's coming from the Uinta Basin over to the Wasatch Front is actually fueling population growth and not agriculture. Eventually, well, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious as to what the conversation is or should be about how we're actually using this resource that we have rather than just building better engineering to get more of it. Um, and for those of us who are interested in having that conversation, how do you have ideas about how we might go about doing that? Ooh, that's a nice, that, that's, that's not a softball question. Um, you know, I, I think that, it, First of all, I guess tackle the first you know, part of this is about the, the, the infrastructure, the, this massive plumbing system and how to really you know, come to grips with this and what we might you know, make of it. I think one of the great dangers of these plumbing systems, the, the, the Central Utah Project, the Bonneville Unit and the proposed Lake Powell Pipeline or the proposed diversion of the Bear River, which would bring more water to the Northern Wasatch Front is that they create the environment for sustaining more and more growth. That um, this, is a, this is a phenomenon we see going back to the development of Los Angeles early in the 20th century, to the, the Owens Valley Aqueduct, to William J. Mulholland and Fred Eaton developing that resource and the continued urban growth. I don't see, I see that the, the great danger, I think of these kind of technological fixes 
is it allows us to avoid or ignore the hard question of, you know, what, um, you know, why are we, what is the intended purpose of this? I mean, sustaining life along the Wasatch Front is possible with the water that we have here. There's sustaining growth is possible along the Wasatch Front with the water that we have here. Um, as Dan McCool, well-known um, water policy expert in Utah said, you know, we don't really have a water problem. We have a water management problem. And I think, you know, that's, you know, absolutely true. Looking at ways to increase um, conservation, but also changing our aesthetic as, as, as a society, you know, moving away from green lawns. You mentioned that 82% of the water may go to agriculture in a given year, and the rest goes to what's known as municipal and irrigate, uh, municipal and industrial uses. Um, the majority of household water that's used, about 10%, the majority of that's used on our lawns. And, um, you know, this year, you know, 60% of that, 6% is used on our lawns, maybe 4% in houses. I think educating the public to those numbers, you know, is a first step, but that's not going to change our aesthetic. Why do we want green lawns? Why do we need those green lawns? I think we're seeing that change over time. I think that getting, I think exhibits like H2O today and waterways that was here before, hopefully get people to think about this resource and think about the way that it's used and its legacy in their communities. Um, getting through to our political leaders, I think, is, is critically important. But I don't know that that is happening in any kind of meaningful way. Um, certainly not when the legislature, legislature creates this, this new committee to study ways to get our full share. And that committee is um, really a very secretive organization. It's, 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 it's set up to have closed meetings and no, no public meetings. And a lot of folks have been concerned with that, certainly in um, the resource community, the environmental community with what's going to happen um, there. And again, the focus is still on development, not on conservation, not on rethinking how we're living in this um, semi-arid and arid state. I don't know if I answered the question or not, but I went on for a long time. At least stop sharing the, um, the screen there and see if there are any other questions in the... Well, I guess yeah. there aren't any other questions. I'll just thank everyone for joining us today. Um, it's always fun to do these. Um, there's so much to um, Utah water um, and Utah water history um, that you, know, you can't cover in a single essay. You can't cover in, in one talk. Um, and that's why, um, Hopefully we're, we're getting at a little bit more of the detail in each of these talks. I and mean, just I'm you know, happy to do this for, um, um, for Vernal and for, for the Uina Basin. All right, Greg, well, thank you for taking time out of your day to, to talk to us and give us a little bit of history on our water over here. I appreciate it. And thanks Megan and Utah Humanities for bringing this project here and for allowing Greg to come and talk to us. We appreciate it. And uh, I guess with that, we'll say goodbye. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah.